to welcome to all of those dialing in from literally uh, all the four corners of the world. So welcome to you all. Uh, it now gives me great pleasure to virtually introduce the president of the ISRM, Lord Toby Harris, who's pre-recorded a video for us. Unfortunately, it's some ungodly hour in the UK at the moment. So just a bit about Lord Toby Harris. Uh, he is the chair of the National Preparedness Commission. He also has extensive experience in public service, governance, and risk management. He's also the former chair uh, of the Metropolitan Police Authority and regu uh, other regulatory bodies. And Lord Toby Harris is most recognized for his independent reviews and his various advisory roles. It gives me great pleasure to now welcome virtually by video Lord Toby Harris on a pre-recorded message for us. I'm sorry not to be with you in person, but as president of the ISRM, I am delighted to have this opportunity to open our first Wicked Problems Summit. It's extraordinary to reflect that the ISRM was launched less than four and a half years ago with the modest objective of bringing together those engaged in strategic risk management, uh, to promote good practice, to share experience, and to progress a wider understanding of why a strategic approach is so necessary to the problems that we face. But now, in just a very short time, the ISRM has become widely recognised as a global thought leader in the strategic risk and crisis management sector, with some 30 chapters worldwide in five continents. And wicked problems is what we are about, and certainly what we've experienced in those four and a half years. A global pandemic, that within weeks of the first reports of an unidentified illness with flu-like symptoms being reported from Wuhan in China, had half the world facing lockdown with deserted cities, uh, compulsory mask wearing, and so on. And then we had war in Europe with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, with the attendant loss of life, but also huge disruption to global supply chains and massive hikes in energy prices. The experience that climate change has arrived with extreme weather events in every part of the world, rampant wildfires in Canada, in Greece, in Australia, in Hawaii, temperatures in excess even in London of 40 degrees last year, and this year in excess of 52 degrees in Xinjiang, 53 degrees in Death Valley in California, and in Basra in Iraq. We've seen flash floods, droughts, cyclones and hurricanes. We've got melting glaciers and ice packs. And then there's the arrival of chat GBT and the realisation of the significance of AI. Four and a half years ago, we were starting to talk about it, but the sheer pace of change and speed with which the technology is developing and being deployed has caught most of us by surprise. The list goes on. But where will we be in another four and a half years, or four and a half years after that, or by 2040 or 2050? These are or should be important questions for policymakers. Now, I don't know whether it's a laugh or cry that in the Republican presidential debate week for last, only one candidate was prepared to admit that climate change was real. And climate change will almost certainly be the dominant factor. As I have already mentioned, this is leading to more extreme weather events both at home and abroad. Floods, droughts, storms, heat waves and heavy rainfall will become more intense and more frequent. This will mean that some parts of the world will become increasingly uninhabitable, driving huge movements of refugees. Possibly a billion, a billion people by 2050. And this will lead to shortages of food and water with an impact on global supply chains and producing political instability that will spill over national borders. Indeed, the world can expect increased competition for natural resources with greater supply insecurities. And this is not just about grain or energy and fuel, but also rare earth minerals necessary in modern technologies. Hence the competition for control of mining rights in Africa, why Wagner mercenaries have been encouraged to have free reign there, the sway of countries that have recently had military coups and so on. And in the Ukraine, the reason why the Donbass area is so hotly contested is because of its mineral wealth, in particular its lithium deposits. 
And that highlights the changing world order and rapid geopolitical change that's taking place. The US is, in any case, surrendering its preeminence, irrespective of the presidential elections next year. But those elections bring considerable uncertainty as to what its stance on climate change, on Ukraine, on the Middle East, on China, will be after next November. At the same time, China is becoming an increasingly dominant economic power. With its Belt and Road Initiative investing in critical infrastructure in Africa, Asia, and Europe, thereby strengthening economic ties and dependency on China all around the globe. And that's coupled with huge technological investments based on the theft of intellectual property through cyber means. A 20 or 30 year program to deliver the sort of global preeminence previously enjoyed by the USA for the last century and arguably Britain in the century before that. Meanwhile, Russia, using both hybrid and kinetic means, is maximizing its influence and trying to restore its status as a world power. At the same time, India and Brazil are emerging as major players, while the future of the European Union becomes less certain. And then think back two years. We have the Texas power failure. Now, that was an illustration of vulnerability in a modern, highly industrialized nation. Texas itself, as a nation, would be the 10th largest economy in the world. And that highlights it. The failure to invest adequately in the maintenance of critical infrastructure, the reliance on ever more complex and interconnected systems, and the dangers of cascade collapse. Now, such vulnerabilities exist around the globe. And as in Texas, no one entity is responsible for mitigating them. So some crises will arise suddenly and unexpectedly, requiring urgent action. Others, like climate change, develop over decades. And the world is increasingly volatile and unstable. And one thing we should learn from the last three years is that we cannot go on burying our heads in the sand. We need to, need to be better prepared for the unexpected. The lesson for all of us, the overriding lesson in every country is that we have probably not been investing sufficiently in our preparedness and resilience. In essence, we have to try and predict the unpredictable. We have to prepare for the uncertain and recognise that some of it will be wrong. And what makes that all the more difficult is that our minds tend to be programmed in ways that make it hard to respond to novel risks and to protracted and complex challenges. We <clears throat> find it easier to believe that something might happen if it comes easily to mind. The more we can picture it, the higher our intuitive estimate of its life. And then there is optimism bias, predisposing us to be over-optimistic about the risk of something bad happening and overconfident about our ability to cope if it does. At worst, this can result in outright denial. And of course, it is harder to form sound judgments about how much effort to invest in preventing low likelihood, very high impact risks. And we're also subject to confirmation bias, that universal tendency to pay attention to what supports our existing beliefs while ignoring information that contradicts them. And then those group think, the inclination to follow the pack and conform to the majority view. But finally, there is NIMTA, not in my term of office. Being properly prepared and resilient is expensive. We need to overturn the last 50 or more years when businesses and organizations have focused on cost cutting and efficiency and on, on eliminating duplication, often to the exclusion of their own resilience. Adopting a preparedness philosophy means parking our just in time approach in favor of just in case and being ready to build in redundancy and avoid interdependence. This is bad enough in the public sector, but even more so in the corporate sector, particularly in a world with an increasing focus on annual returns in quarterly figures. Now, I am a recovering politician, so I know how difficult it is for our elected leaders to devote testimony to, to projects that do not come to fruition 
by the time of the next election, let alone the one after it. Or build resilience that is probably invisible and may never be needed for an eventuality that may not happen. And it's usually impossible to prove that your actions have prevented something happening, particularly if that hypothetical event is at some indeterminate time in the future and almost certainly long after your term of office is forgotten. That's why Mayor Wamura of Fudai in Japan is such a rare exception. He served as mayor for 40 years. We elected nine times, and that's quite something. But beginning in 1972, he was ridiculed for insisting on building floodgates 51 feet high, a huge 673-foot sea wall at a cost of $30 million. But he was vindicated by the tsunami of 2011 that obliterated other nearby towns, but not for die. 3,000 residents owed their lives to his foresight, but he was by then long dead, and his only thanks were the many flowers laid on his grave. So to be resilient and prepared, we need to scan the horizon, what's out there but not yet looming, if you like, Elijah's cloud, no bigger than a man's hand. And we've got to look out for rum spills, unknown unknowns. So we have to prepare for and build general resilience. In the UK, I chair the National Preparedness Commission. This brings together around 50 leading figures from public life, academia, business and civil society. The commission was conceived before COVID hit, but the last few years have highlighted how vital its central purpose to promote better preparedness for the UK for a major crisis or incident has become. Just a month ago, the UK government published its latest national risk register. This highlights 89 major risks facing the country. They're grouped into nine risk themes, terrorism, cyber, state threats, geographic and, dipl and diplomatic, accidents and system failures, natural environment hazards, human, animal and plant health, societal and conflict of flexibility. Perhaps as a sign that we're living in a world that is increasingly volatile and unstable, the previous edition from 2020 only listed 38 risks, whereas the first UK risk register back in 2008 only highlighted 12. Now, every nation and every government will have its equivalent. But effective resilience and preparedness cannot just be a matter for national governments. It has to be a whole of society approach. If you make every level of government, every organization, and every community more resilient, you can create a sort of herd immunity for a society that's better able to address future global crises, whether it's a new pandemic, or a massive cyber attack, or climate change. And this is also true for each household and every individual. We all have our part to play. Now, the theme of today's summit is wicked problems. Mm. At the risk of being cliched, I will remind you of the ancient Chinese curse. <laughs> May you live in interesting times. Today's times are certainly interesting. However, there is another Chinese saying that's also relevant. Gain wisdom from the experience of setbacks. It is, of course, a truism that generals always prepare to fight the last war rather than the one that is actually coming. But to David Oman, the, former, the UK's former security coordinator, recasts in a slightly different way. He said, what we prepare for, we deter. So what we actually experience by way of events is, alas, what we have not prepared for. The reality is that our nations, our cities and communities and our organisations have to have preparedness and resilience designed in. It has to be part of society's fabric. Ultimately, it means that every single one of us has to be um, has to see preparedness and resilience as their responsibility, just as much as it is the responsibility of public authorities. Because there's always the assumption that someone else will sort it out. Be prepared was, of course, Lord Baden Powell's motto for the scout movement. The idea that automatically and instinctively you did the right thing at the right moment. 
Now, I'm not sure that the 1908 edition of Scouting for Boys or the 1912 version for girls, how girls can help build up the empire, had in mind the sort of emergencies we face today. But the principle was absolutely sound. out. We all need to be resilient. We all need to prepare for risks. Of course, it's not cost-free, but not doing so is worse. Or as John F. Kennedy put it, there are risks and costs to action, but they are far less than the long-range costs of comfortable inaction. We cannot ignore our wicked problems. We have to prepare for them, whatever they may be. Thank you.